So for those of you who weren't here uh, this morning, I will introduce myself again. My name is Camille Cameron. I'm the Dean at the Schulich School of Law. Um, and we're gathered this afternoon for the second part of today's celebration. And this is a panel event which we call Reconciliation in Education. Uh, it seemed to us to be a great way to honor and to mark um, the honorary degree ceremony given the commitment that Dr. Degane has had to uh, reconciliation and education. So this was a great way, I think, to, um, to add to, the, to texture um, the honorary uh, degree uh, event. So we've gathered a group of people. Some will be presenters and then some responders. Um, we'll have our presenters talk about some aspect or some dimension of reconciliation in education. We will then take a break and there are some responders who will respond to any one or any number of the presentations that have been made. Again, keeping in mind the theme of reconciliation and education. What I think I'll do, probably more for efficiency, is to introduce now the people who will be presenting. We'll then go through um, the presentations. We'll then take a break, and then I can introduce the responders, and then the responders will um, uh, present their comments. Um, so now, if I may, I will tell you a little bit about who our presenters are for the afternoon. Um, the first presenter we have, known to many of you, is Professor Duma Young. Uh, Duma Young is a Lenu Mi'kmaq who grew up traditionally on the Malagawatch First Nation and was born into the Adudawetch Squirrel Clan for the uh, Bligamuch, I got some help from Duma on the pronunciation, <laughs> rabbit clan. Uh, he is one of 14 children, born to William F. Young and Veronica Phillips, both of the Koba First Nation, later centralized to Eskazoni. Duma has a Bachelor of Arts in Mi'kmaq Studies from University College of Cape Breton, a Bachelor of Laws from the University of British Columbia, a Master of Laws in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy from the University of Arizona, and is presently enrolled in the SJD program at the University of Arizona. Duma is now an Assistant Professor in Mi'kmaq Studies at Cape Breton University, where he teaches in the areas of Mi'kmaq history and governance. He's also engaged in community-based research on social assistance reform in First Nation communities, two-spirited resilience, and Lanu medicines. So that's Duma. Next, we have Professor Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams has been the director of the Indigenous Blacks and Mi'kmaq Initiative at the Schulich School of Law, Dalhousie University, since 2004. She's also taught at the Law School Criminal Law and a seminar on African Nova Scotian legal issues. She coordinates the IB and M Initiative pre-law course and is a member of the Law School's Truth and Reconciliation Implementation Committee. She's also a member of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society Race Equity Committee. Michelle also currently serves as the co-lead of Dalhousie University's Strategic Priority 5.2, which focuses on fostering a collegial culture grounded in diversity and inclusiveness. And she's involved in the Nova Scotia Judicial Mentorship Initiative. So that's Michelle. Then we will have Dr. Jane McMillan. Dr. Jane McMillan is the former Canada Research Chair for Indigenous Peoples and Sustainable Communities, that's from 2006 to 2016, and is current Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of Anthropology at St. Francis Xavier University. She has worked with the Mi'kmaq Nation for over 20 years, conducting ethnographic research, policy analysis, and advocating for Indigenous treaty rights community-based justice, culturally aligned resource regulation and governance. As a former eel fisher, I found that quite interesting, as a former eel fisher and one of the original defendants in the Supreme Court of Canada Marshall decision, she follows with special interest the significant changes that have occurred in Mi'kmaq as a result of that decision. She was the president of the Canadian Law and Society Association, and is coordinator of the Law and Indigeneity Collaborative Research Network of the American Law and Society Association, and a member of the Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia Canada Tripartite Forum Justice Committee. Her book on settling justice, Mi'kmaq Legal Traditions and the Legacy of Donald Marshall Jr. will be released by UBC Press in September 2018. We then have the Honorable Graydon Nicholas, 
The Honorable Graydon Nicholas, Order of New Brunswick, was the 30th Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick from 2009 to 2014, becoming the first Aboriginal person to hold this office. He was born on the Tobique Reserve in 1946. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree from St. Francis Xavier University in 1968, a law degree from UMB Law School in 1971, and a Master of Social Work degree from Wilfrid Laurier University in 1974. He has received four honorary degrees from St. Francis Xavier University, Wilfrid Laurier University, Mount Allison, and UNB. He was a provincial court judge from 1991 to 2009. And he was chair of Native Studies at St. Thomas University from 1989 to 1991. He worked with the Union of New Brunswick Indians as legal counsel, chairman of the board, and president of the Union of New Brunswick Indians from 1974 to 1988. Graydon was appointed to the Endowed Chair of Native Studies at St. Thomas University in August 2015 for a one-year term, which has since been renewed for a further uh, two-year period. He is involved with teaching, research, and community interaction. And by the way, he's also a recipient of the Order of Canada, May 2016. The Honorable Chief Justice Lawrence O'Neill. Um, Associate Chief Justice Lawrence O'Neill is a graduate of St. Francis Xavier University, Dalhousie Law School, and completed a year of graduate studies in law at the University of Alberta, studying in the area of energy law with a focus on the development of Canada's energy resources. He was admitted to the Nova Scotia Bar in 1979 and to the Ontario Law Society in 1992. At the time of his appointment to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, he was working as a criminal defense lawyer with Nova Scotia Legal Aid. He was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia in 2007 and Associate Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia Family Division in 2011. He has extensive experience at the senior levels of government, having served in advisory roles to the Premier of Nova Scotia and the Prime Minister of Canada and as a member of the House of Commons. That's before he became a judge, by the way, but I think you could figure that out for yourself. <laughs> He served as a member of parliament representing the northern region of Nova Scotia, uh, a region which included three First Nations communities. While a member of parliament, he served on several standing committees of the House of Commons as a, as a chair of the Regional Development Committee and the committee that was then known as the Committee of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. After returning to Nova Scotia, he engaged in the practice of law in the Strait of Cancer region, as I said, working in private practice and uh, then for Nova Scotia Legal Aid. And finally for our presenters, Professor Naomi Metallic, again known to many of you. Naomi is from the Listigouche Mi'kmaq First Nation in uh, Gaspé. Uh, she is an associate professor at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University, where she also holds a Chancellor's Chair in Aboriginal Law and Policy, and Naomi was the inaugural chairholder of that chair. She holds a BA from Dalhousie, an LLB from Dalhousie, an LLL from, LLL from Ottawa, and an LLM <laughs> from Osgoode. Uh, she was a law clerk to the Honorable Michelle Bastarache of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2006 and 2007. Naomi still continues to practice law with the firm of Virgils in Halifax, where she practiced for nearly a decade before becoming an academic. Uh, she's been named to Best Lawyers in Canada list in Aboriginal Law. As a legal scholar, she is most interested in writing about how the law can be harnessed to promote the well-being and self-determination of Indigenous peoples in Canada. So that completes the, um, the presenters, and I wanted to read that to you so you'd get a sense of the, the richness of, and the quality of the people who are going to be presenting here. They've asked, been asked to present on some topic of reconciliation in education. Uh, it was left largely to them to pick the focus. Um, and so I think we'll kick it off with Professor Duma Young. over there and I always like to scan the room in the way, right? Um, first, first of all, I'd like to just say um, it's a little bit of a homecoming for me here at Friendship Center. And 
1988, I graduated from the WAP program here, the Wetchkwabaniaka University Preparatory Program here at Friendship Center. So uh, the Friendship Center has always been home for a lot of UNOs coming into Halifax area. And it has been for over, um, I think, at least 40, 50 years anyways at this, right? Uh, starting from the time when it was down at the Bruntrick Street here and moved up here. And hopefully within a short period of time we'll have a, a brand new home for this place. Because it's home for many UNOs from all over Canada and all over Mi'kma'ki and all over Willis to to come here, you know. And often, when they arrive in the city, this is the first place they go, you know. Even when the Friendship Center is closed at night, UNOs seem to come here, even if they arrive here. So that's why Friendship Center is a very important thing. And the work we do as academics, as lawyers, as uh, members of the judiciary and as when we think about legal concepts and legal thoughts and, and the theme of reconciliation and education we must never ever forget that the things we do permeate down to the folks who are working in the grassroots and that's why you know it's particularly for me to come here and see the work we do actually become in practice for example friendship center if you look around has a lot of reconciliation work that is done over the years so, how I like to do things is I, I like to tell a story. I'm a bit of a storyteller, more so than anything else, right? No. Uh, and all of our stories, all those stories, begin at some point, like with creation stories. We have creation stories. We talk about life. We talk about medicines. We talk about our loss in all of these stories. No. Some of these stories are about contact, about the diseases that came, you know. The wars, the treaties, relief, rations, and generally, all of these stories are all about trying to live with each other as neighbors, you know, in Mi'kma'ki. Some of these stories are very pleasant, humorous ones. Some are not so pleasant. Some are downright terrifying. Some are very difficult to hear, you know. But these are all part of the stories that we need to tell as part of our reconciliation efforts. You know. Some of these stories are told with humor, some are told with drama, some are told with flair. Many others are told with grief and sadness. You know. um, some are just told, I remember when I had a young woman in my uh, car driving up to Cape Breton University, she was a student, and she was telling me about her encounters with the children's aid. And I realized that she was telling me her story, not to tell me, but it seemed so crazy what happened to her that she was trying to make sense of it by repeating the story over and over again until she finally understood it you know, to herself. And some of our stories are like that. We tell them over and over again, not so much that we want you to listen, but to help us understand just what happened. Many of these stories, they have no beginning. And they really don't have an ending. Sometimes when one story ends, and another one picks up, begins. So that's what we're here for. We're looking at stories that are what I call Elis Hanawadasiko. They're braided together to make the, you know, the whole thing, right? You know? So how did we get here? How do we get to talk about reconciliation through education? Where does this story begin? You know, we talked a little bit. And it's not, it didn't begin when Dean Cameron and I had lunch at the university club a few months ago, I you know. And she said, we're thinking about doing this. What is it that you think about? And I'm like, this is what we should do. <laughs> like, somebody asked me, they said, uh, are you in some sort of leadership position? I said, no, I'm just a tenure track assistant professor. I said, they would, they, nobody should let me near a leadership position. <laughs> <laughs> I just take right over. Right? <laughs> Anyways, we talked about what we should do. But that story here doesn't begin there. No. It doesn't, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission started in 2008. They started their work. But even the story doesn't begin there. Um, I was hoping to, to I, I saw Dr. Fred Wien here and Iola, 
They were part of the Royal Commission on, on Aboriginal People. 20 years ago, we were just 21 years ago. And they had that statement of reconciliation. And the Honorable Minister, James Stewart, have made that statement, right, of regret. But this story doesn't begin there either. No. It doesn't begin with the Indian Residential School settlement either. No. I remember being in Ottawa at the AFN when they announced that. And I quickly did some calculations and I said the percentages, you know, like contingency fee agreements for lawyers, everything. I'm like, you know, there's a problem here. You know, that type of thing. So, but our story doesn't begin there either. You know? It doesn't begin with the Healing Foundation either. You know? In fact, it begins long before that. You know? It begins, it doesn't even begin with the Shubanakli Residential School or the Indian Day Schools that I went through for eight years. You know? And then now people are starting to talk about the Indian Day Schools. It doesn't, that doesn't begin there. You know? Now, but enough of that. Where does our story begin? You know, um, I can't tell you a whole lot of the story because you only have a few minutes here. You know? But the stories need to be told as part of our reconciliation efforts in our educational systems. You know? Here, I cannot tell you. I gotta skip over a few things, right? You know? I say the story begins with that young woman in Wee Martin who had a dream about tree bears floating on an island in, sitting in the trees. And she didn't know what that meant. And so she consulted the elders and they didn't know what it meant. But it foretold the shadowing of the coming of the Europeans. That story has been told over and over again. And yes, it is cited. There's a citation. You know, it's not necessarily the McGill Citation 8 edition or anything like that. But the citation is embedded in the rocks outside of Kejim you know, If you want to get the citation, all you have to do is learn how to read the petroglyphs. You know. And some folks can. There's, that's the story is right there. So it's just how we look at these things, right? So, but we have to fast forward to the Time. We're doing time travel here. Mm -hmm. Skipping, you know, warp speed. I finally figured out what warp speed is. Hard track. You know, it's time from going from here to here, but you warp time. So instead of going long this way, you go shorter distance. So that's what we're doing. In a way, we got we're we're skipping over the middle ground experience, the baptism of Henry Member Two, smallpox blankets, the wars, the scalping proclamations, the peace and friendship treaties. The petitions to the crown, the near extermination of the Ilnu, the ordinary Mount people, you know, the creation of Canada, the imposition of the Indian Act, extinguishment of our rights, enfranchisement, you know, the loss of land, self-determination, self-government, the denial of the treaties, culture, language, and all of this stuff, and our basic humanness as Ilnu people. Can't tell the story. We're skipping that over. We're skipping over the part that also deals with resilience and resistance. You know, you know those parts that we kind of hear about in our stories, but never are really taught, where John Shabbat, when he landed and he planted the cross, and the Mi'kmaq people of Gaspé resisted. They said, what are you doing? You know, and he said, oh, we just <coughs> planted the cross where we can pray. What, what are these letters? What are these words? And what is this declaration that this lands for England or for France? Oh, don't worry about that. We are worried. But that's the story we were told. But that's not the story that's told in our education systems. You know, we're skipping the story about how Yilnu hit the Acadians, you know, the protests of the Grand Council over the movement of Member 2 from King's Road up to where it is, you know, the refusal of Wego Ma folks to move during centralization, you know, and the treaty cases of Silliboy, Simon, Marshall, Bernard, and others. We're not going to tell the story about the raids on this to which, when they exercise their Aboriginal treaty rights. You know, the Nicholas Lovelace human rights complaint against Canada and the United Nations. Or about Bill C-31 land claims, hunger strikes, moose hunts, burn church, I don't know more, often gas, fracking, 
and many other stories of resistance and resilience. We're not going to tell those stories. No. We're skipping all of these stories to get to the place in time here. As many of you know about Thomas King, I use his book in one of my classes, The Inconvenient Indian. You know, and there's a chapter in there, chapter 7, I believe it is. It's called Forget About It. And how he says, we're all supposed to forget about all these things and move on to. But we can't. We say those stories over again, just like that young woman in my car who was trying to tell them over and over and over again so it makes sense. When we look and hear about all these stories that came to us, about all that happened, none of it makes sense. No. That's where our stories begin, the only way. So when I have to think deeply about an issue, I often go to my Anui Daso thing, Anui Worldview. I wrote about it in a paper that was published, and everybody said, but I had to think long and clear about a particular issue, and I think about it from that point. So, reconciliation through education. Reconciliation, I had this conversation with Chief Terry Paul a few weeks ago, and he says, how would you say that term in Mi'kmaq? I said, well, there's a couple terms. Right, you know, a big sick tuan doesn't quite get it either, too. No, ila madu tink, no, el pugual, el pugual muk, no, close comes close to it. All these words, but basically, the words reflect we need to restore the relationship to what it was and to what before what happened. No before the residential school, before all these things. Basically, we almost have to go right back to 1492. You know, before the Christopher Columbus sailed the three ships and stuff. Besides, that story was wrong to me. You know? <laughs> so, when we had contact, when we decided to live together in Mi'kmaq, the middle ground experience where both interactions resulted in a benefit to each other. No, but that quickly changed after. No. So, how do we tell this story about reconciliation when quickly after contact, that's, that story went sideways? No. How do we do that? So, forgiveness or abixituan, you know, is kind of restoring the relationship to what it once was. To have a renewed relationship based on principles that have brought us together. We're supposed to forget about all the impacts of colonization, the impacts of disease, the loss of our lands, the loss of the wars, the treaties, denials. You know, as chapter seven in the book says, forget about it. You know, it's a bit hard. It's a bit of a, you know, on indigenous sides, reconciliation would be a tough pill to swallow, you know, in this sense. So we're also supposed to forget about the stories of the Unu who went to residential schools. You often hear it now, it's kind of, you know, get over it type of thing, well, let's move on and, you know, and you know, all those stuff. You know, it's not that easy. You know? And we're supposed to forget the role of governments in establishing laws that force the young know, to go to the residential schools. You know? We're supposed to forget about the role of the legal system in all of this. The roles of lawyers and judges in this of the entire residential school system, including the most recent stories about lawyers' behaviors. And some of them continue to, we continue to hear these stories still happening. So we're supposed to forget about the roles of our schools, you know, the educational systems and the universities in the teaching or the non-teaching of our stories. But we can't forget. So, again, I'm skipping over. I don't have a lot of time and stuff like this. No. And Thomas King says, no, we've got to get into this. Really, no. What is it that we want? No. Most, as Thomas King says, a lot of us just want to be left alone, live our lives in good ways and everything like this, but also to be able to live our lives. So if we want to achieve reconciliation through education, and that's the theme here, we need to include these stories in what we teach in our educational institutions at the elementary school level, junior high, middle school, high school, 
universities, in Mi'kmaq studies programs, in the law schools, in the professional nursing programs, in, the, in all of our universities and education systems. We need to include these stories. We just, you know, we have to tell them again and tell them from another side, another perspective. So that's what I want us to think about. So after we start teaching, what can we do? You know? And so in preparation for this, it's going to be hard work. And the hard work is not only to teach, but to incorporate, to embed all of these things into the work we all do. It's one thing to do easy stuff, the land acknowledgments, you know, the, the blanket exercise and stuff. And I'm not saying that those are easy by any means, but the real work of reconciliation is going to be, as you know, in the language of Kate Buckner, freaking tough. <laughs> you know, but we got to do it. You know. In particularly, we need to embed legal new perspectives in everything that we do. In particularly, in our laws, our legal systems, our, ju our judiciary, our judgments, our regulatory and certification processes. You know, that's where we have to put these things in. There's a number of calls to actions that are directed at the legal system, at our educational system. There's a, all of these have particular ways, right? I'm thinking about 25 to 42. That's what people say, I'll focus on zoom, zooming and stuff like that. And as part of the work I do with the Federation of Law Societies, we are looking at call number 26 and call number 27. And I'm like, but what about the others? What about the other calls? Well, no, those are just directed towards what we do. <laughs> That's the ones we need to focus on and do. No, but there's others. At least 90 more, you know, and then some, right? So, I think we've got to consider them all in the work we do, even if we are looking at particular ones. For example, language. The ones on language 13 to 17. Now, how does that embed into the work we all do here? Well, one of the things is that the Mi'kmaq language is dying and it's going to become extinct fairly soon. No. Early on, I was, I was heralded as the first Mi'kmaq lawyer to be fluent in Nova Scotia. And that was in 2001 when I was called to the bar. For many years, I thought I would be the only one. No. And probably I thought maybe I'll be the last one. No. That's not a good state to be in. No. So in the work we do, in the teaching of our stories, we also have to be look at all the other calls and look at when if we want to do this, we also have to do this. We also have to save the language. We have to take desperate, you know, drastic actions to do it. You know, all the universities in the Halifax area have had a difficult time trying to find somebody to teach basic media. We've been doing that, asking for it since I was a student here in back then almost 35 years of asking. We still haven't really gotten it right. No. So, yet, our language is where the vast majority of our uh, legal principles can be found. Almost, I would say 75% of it. We lose the language, we lose legal principles. No. So if we want to incorporate and use some new legal principles and laws in the justice system, in the courts, we need to share the language. We need to save it and do the research necessary to bring out these concepts and bring them to the forefront. And that's where I zoomed in. We're going to be zooming in on a particular call. My job is to zoom in on one. And that's Truth and Reconciliation Call Action number 50. But 50 doesn't have, it's not the ones directed at the legal system. Well, that's where 50 basically calls for the government to fund an indigenous law institute. You know? And it's, I'm going to read it out here. And it says, in keeping with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, we call upon the federal government, in collaboration with Aboriginal organizations, to fund the establishment of indigenous law institutes for the development, use, and understanding of indigenous laws and access to justice in accordance with the unique cultures of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. And I'm like, you know, in the conversation I had with uh, Associate Chief Justice O'Neill um, uh, a few years ago, right? 
he brought this to my attention. And I'm like, I didn't read really, I, you know, I had read the whole thing and I went straight to the ones in the, and I had zoomed in. And I said, I have to step back and look at the whole thing yet. Yeah. And he says, what can you do with this? What can we do? How can we help? You know, how do we bring this to fruition? How do we make this? And I'm like, well, I think we should look at this. It's one thing to see the story, listen to the story, wring our hands in grief and say, oh God, terrible things have happened. But we have to do something. We have to work at it. No, we have to go towards this goal. And having an indigenous law, legal institute or law center would be a good start. So I'm proposing that Cape Breton University, of course, <laughs> along with the Schulich School of Law, of course, and why not University of New Brunswick School of Law, uh, and the University of De Moncton School of Law. No, these are all law schools that operate in Mi'kmaq and Wulustuk Wewai territory. Right? You know, we should work together on establishing a what I would call Wechkwabemiak Institute of Law, indigenous of Wabanagi legal principles, that we can do research on, find out what they were bring them to the forefront, and then train, embed these into the work we all do. It's not enough for a court to sit on a reserve. We need that court, we need those institutions, we need the law schools to use Wabanagi legal principles. No. So I'm thinking, imagine if you're a judge in New Brunswick and you can use you know, the Pasmokwadi, Pasmokwadiya legal principles to resolve a dispute on contracts in St. John's, maybe between Irving or somebody else. <laughs> can you imagine? Oh, I can. You know? we, or a judge in Yarmouth using the concept of Nudugalimk to settle a fishery dispute down there. No, that would be reconciliation if we can get that. Or the you know the court that's going to be uprising, they're going up in Pamuku using you know Gisakalek, Gisakalek to in confirming Mi'kmaq customary adoptions you know, instead of using the Notice for the Child Welfare Act type of thing. You know, why can't we use our own traditional customary adoptions in that in the concept of it? Right, you know? Or a federal court judge using the concept of a big sick to one to resolve disputes over elections. No, why can't we do it? But this is where the West Kavniach Institute of Law, to me, you know, would offer the best help. Imagine our law schools teaching Wabanani legal principles. You know? Imagine the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, I'm not gonna lecture you off the whole thing. <laughs> Requiring competence in Mi'kmaq law before admitting anybody to the profession. No. And I think we all need to work together to make this happen, a multi-university approach. You know? There's not, I don't think one university can do this by themselves. So that's why we need to bring up. Cape Breton University has expertise in Mi'kmaq studies, in governance, language. Uh, the Mi'kmaq Maliseet Institute you know, in New Brunswick also has particular expertise. Schulich School of Law has particular expertise. Um, the Mount St. Vincent University has particular expertise. We need to bring them all together to join in this one institute. No, because it's going to take a multidisciplinary approach to, and a multi-perspective to get this done. No. And if Nipissin wants in on this, <laughs> by God, this, the Anishinaabe are our cousins. No. And we belong to the same Algonquin linguistic family, so you know, what we can learn here can be applied there, and what they have there can be applied somewhat here, you know. And, you know, we won't talk about the Haudenosaunee, how they accept it. That's a different story of our history to tell, right? You know? But we do know that research is desperately needed in this area, so true reconciliation can happen, you know. We have smart folks at all these universities. And Naomi's going to kill me because I'm going to say, well, no, Naomi, it's one more thing for us to do, right? No. <laughs> it's one more thing for all of us to do. That's the thing. We can make this a reality. But it's going to be hard. 
Let nobody be under any illusion. Reconciliation is difficult. You know, it's going to be hard work, and it's going to it's going to challenge each and every one of us. You know, challenge us in ways we never thought possible. You know, anymore. It really requires a paradigm shift. You know, it really requires us to gapaygal sopiti, a total commitment. We need to pick up that bundle and go with it. Right? You know? And that, in, when we do that, the story will continue to be told. We'll continue, Elis Kanawadamu, will continue with the braiding of reconciliation to education. So when we tell that story in 50 years, or the next generation, 100 years, of how either we went sideways or we accomplished it, I don't know how it's going to end. But like all the new stories, there's no really beginning or end. It will just continue. Well, I'll go. <laughs> As tempted as I am to um, comment, I'm not going to. I'm going to say that for the responders. And I'll ask Professor Michelle Williams now from the Schulich School of Law to speak. Um, well, I'll comment and just say that sounds like an excellent idea, and let's go for it. Um, sounds great. Um, so uh, thank you for um, including me in today's panel. Um, I'm going to shift gears. Um, Professor Young did a wonderful historical overview in, in a short period of time, and so I'm just going to sort of zero in on a little bit of a, a narrower dimension or snapshot of the work of the Indigenous Blacks and Mi'kmaq Initiative um, within that uh, broader context. Um, and particularly pleased that we have some of our current students here, um, but also students from CBU who are really hoping that we'll continue on the path of law school, and so um, it's great to have you here. Um, so, uh, I was sort of considering the question that, that, of course, was asked was if reconciliation involves restoring equity and balance in the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and thank you, Duma, for sort of saying, well, when are we starting that question um, around contact or before then? Um, what role has the IBM initiative played in that process of reconciliation? And so there's sort of three main points that I wanted to address in, in sort of uh, trying to answer that question. Um, one is to, to just um, briefly touch on the origins of the IBM initiative within that, that broader context. Uh, secondly, to highlight a few of the elements of the IBM initiative that I think do contribute to reconciliation and education. And then finally, talk about what more needs to be done. Um, so first of all, um, for Juma's comments, the initiative is part of a much larger quest um, for Mi'kmaq justice in the broadest sense, um, which includes access to legal education, the legal system, and the profession, um, including the judiciary, and access to substantive justice. So not just access to the system, so we can be in the system, but to actual outcomes that are transformative. Um, and so we know, uh, as a result, I think everybody here, of the courage and perseverance of Donald Marshall Jr. and his family and supporters and advocates. A royal commission was struck to examine the wrongful com his wrongful conviction and imprisonment. Um, and the commission's recommendations were designed uh, to, to, in part, eradicate racism from the justice system, but I think also to move us along the road to a Mi'kmaq justice system, again, more broadly. Um, so the recommendation 11 of the Marshall Inquiry called for support of the IBM initiative, um, but there were many recommendations that were never implemented, and I think Dr. McMillan may be touching upon some of these because she certainly has done a lot of um, follow-up work in this area. Um, but one of those recommendations was, sounds like an echo of what you were just presenting um, around Recommendation 50, and that was uh, the Marshall Recommendation 21, which was calling for a Native Justice Institute, right? And that's now some uh, almost 30 years ago. Um, so it shows that this really is a long path. Um, and so uh, the creation of the IBM initiative arose um, from this recommendation to redress uh, injustice. Which brings me to my second point, and that is how has the IBM initiative actually facilitated um, reconciliation and education? And here I uh, briefly reference um, Article 14 of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which speaks to the rights of education, the right to education, and TRC call to action number seven um, calls for a strategy to eliminate educational and employment gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. 
And so I think the IBA initiative helps give effect to those recommendations in addition to TRC call to action number 28, which talks about mandatory education within the, um, the law school itself. Uh, and so how do we do that a little more pointedly? Well, first, of course, we recruit and support uh, Mi'kmaq and other indigenous um, students to come to law school. And we currently have uh, 16 Mi'kmaq students across all three years at law school and another 68 uh, indigenous students who have graduated uh, over the time of the IBM initiative. Um, and um, I think each person, of your point about stories, um, obviously has their own story. And um, when you uh, meet the applicants in the first instance and you read the personal statements, they're, they're um, very often driven by a desire to make the change that we're talking about, to, to contribute in their way um, to reconciliation. Uh, it's very powerful. Um, so part of, I think, the importance of the work we're doing is to provide, as uh, Dr. Degagne talked about, institutional support. Um, that is really helpful in terms of everything from funding to uh, peer educational support um, to uh, support in terms of navigating the legal system and, and learning this about this whole new world, which all law students are doing, um, but I think can be um, particularly challenging sometimes for those of us who aren't um, as long into the legal field as maybe other communities are. Um, and so we provide that in part by having some uh, key staff people and others engaged in the work that we're doing. Um, and I would be remiss to, to do this conversation without talking about Valerie Armstrong, who's a, a key um, part of our work at the IBM Initiative, elder and residents, uh, Jane Abram, who was unable to be here today, um, Heather McNeil, who's been in our advisory council for a very long time and helps guide us. And so uh, there really are a lot of people, many more than I that even mentioned, um, and I'll come to you in a moment, uh, who are um, part of the work that um, we're trying to unfold in supporting students. Um, and the students themselves, in addition to coming and up, taking up a legal education, are contributing themselves to reconciliation from the moment that they arrive. So whether it be from class discussions, to research that they take up, to work that's done by the Indigenous Law Students Association, they are immediately part of this process of reconciliation and education. Um, and also, um, through specific student-led initiatives that really run the gamut, and just to highlight a couple, uh, Jarvis Gugu, one of our graduates, helped to develop the Donald Marshall Junior Award at the school, and uh, Rosalie Francis, uh, the portrait which now hangs in our atrium. Uh, we also had students who developed the Mi'kmaq Articling Initiative, which enables Mi'kmaq students to spend at least part of their articling time working with a Mi'kmaq organization. So again, these are, are student um, creative ideas that, that translate into reconciliation efforts. Um, in addition to the student role, of course, we have um, trying to change the curriculum, and that's been talked about a fair bit today. Um, but certainly, um, that's been accelerated uh, with Professor Metallic joining us in the role of the Chancellor's Chair. Um, and, but just to highlight a few of the sort of offerings that we have at Aboriginal Rights Moot, of course, we've had, um, prior to all of that, uh, Professor Llewellyn and Nagani's intensive course and, and other offerings in Indian residential schools. Um, and then we're moving in a further direction that the Dean had already highlighted, um, and I think we sort of need, need to make a lot more effort um, down that road in terms of making material mandatory for all students to learn, uh, but also creating the opportunities in the room for the introduction of Wabanaki legal notions integrated into how we're even understanding and teaching law overall. Um, so all of those help give effect to TRC Call to Action 28. There are also similar recommendations, again, back to the Marshall Inquiry number 13 and 14 that, that advocate for the same approach in terms of changing curriculum and uh, teaching. Um, so finally, the third element that I wanted to highlight uh, was the impact of our graduates. So we can talk about reconciliation and education in terms of students coming in, in terms of changing the curriculum and the, our overall approach to law generally, but I think we would really be remiss to not consider the impact that our network of graduates have had in addressing all of the calls to action under TRC, so in, in all of the areas that we can think about. Um, and given the central role, as has already been mentioned, that law has played in colonization, assimilation attempts, the creation and maintenance of residential schools and other harmful structures, it's imperative that we have people out there uh, who are legally trained to address um, all of those impacts and legacies. 
Um, and so uh, our students start very early on working with many of our graduates on projects that relate, for example, to Mi'kmaq Child Welfare, um, the uh, Nova Scotia Native Women's Association really sort of leading the creation of um, the current inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, but our alumni really, again, are across the field in doing this work. And I, I just want to highlight a few, I could spend the rest of our afternoon <laughs> actually uh, going over that, but I've mentioned a couple who are in this room, Heather and Naomi, and, and there are others I know. Um, but um, Jaime Batiste, for example, is treaty education lead for the province. Um, and Viola Robinson and uh, Joby Marshall were here earlier, and we all know about the impact they've made in Mi'kmaq and beyond. Uh, over the years. Uh, Chief Paul Prosper is uh, leading a lot of the work on uh, Mi'kmaq child welfare and, and uh, other justice issues. Jarvis Gugu is the health director of the Atlantic Policy Congress of First Nations Chiefs. And Patty Joel Bedwell was here earlier and she is a, a part of the Indigenous uh, Steering Committee um, in cha making changes across Dalhousie University as a whole. And so that's just a snapshot, a real small sample of the impact that our graduates are having as a network on creating reconciliation through education. Um, and so just briefly, uh, we have a lot more work to do. Um, I don't want to get the impression that all is well. We are still actually very early on, I think, in reconciliation, particularly in light of the history that um, you had mapped, um, Professor Young. And so um, we certainly need more Mi'kmaq and Indigenous students, both through the IBM, but more broadly, I think, through our admissions process. Um, we also need to um, expand our Mi'kmaq leadership and support uh, at the law school, including the role of our elder and residents. We need more Mi'kmaq and other indigenous faculty. Uh, we have two, uh, Naomi and Patty Joe Bedwell, who attained their Master's of Law, but I think we need a more systematic approach to supporting our students in, in going to grad school so that we can have more um, joint academia. Uh, also more uh, formalized partnerships in addressing legal issues, um, and that I think echoes the uh, call to action number 50. So we have lots of, uh, of our, our alumni out working in organizations, but how can we formalize that through an institute like you suggested so that it's a more systematic response and approach to what we're doing? Um, and, um, here we are. So there's probably a lot more um, that I'm, I'm looking forward to learning about and hearing from, from other speakers about what we could be doing better. Um, but I think uh, we certainly have made a contribution uh, to reconciliation over these years. Thank you, Michelle. Next we have Dr. Jane McMillan from St. Francis Xavier University. Thank you. Can you see me, Bill? Yeah. Can you hear me, Bill? <laughs> Hi, I'm really happy to be here. A few years ago, Hereditary Chief Stephen Augustine shared with me his thinking about the highest or most profound of Mi'kmaq laws is that of honor and respect, as in Get Me Day Demenech. It's an honor to be here. Get Me Day Demenech, Dr. Degagne. I honor you and I respect you and I really admire the incredible healing work that you do against the edifices and treacheries of colonialism. In this dialogue on education and reconciliation, I wish to emphasize the concept of responsibility. In this case, the responsibility to learn. To learn about ourselves, to learn about each other, and to learn about those who came before us so that we might better know the heritage of the healing foundations we walk upon. I'm going to tell you a quick story because Duma always gets me in a storytelling mood. <laughs> on one of our first dates, Donald Marshall Jr. brought me here to the Friendship Center. It was a gathering, it was Treaty Day. It was the first Treaty Day uh, without his father, the Grand Chief, who had passed away earlier in August. In this room, a splendid feast was put together, collectively, collaboratively made by hunters, fishers, gatherers, bakers from all over the seven districts. It was a really warm, and joyous, and friendly, safe gathering of friends and family who came together to honor and to respect each other, to honor and respect the memories of their ancestors, and to uphold and celebrate the life of their treaties. It was some nice, as Junior would say. 
Later that night, though, a group of us, mostly Junior's cousins and friends from Wegoma, not small men, you see how they grow them up there, but gentlemen. We were in a lineup, and we were waiting to get into the old Misty Moon. Now the young uh, or people of the audience aren't going to know what the Misty Moon was, but think of it like the, uh, I don't know, is the liquor dome still there? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, so we were, we were standing in the line, and a, a group of pretty drunk young guys come out and start hurling racial slurs at us, and a brawl ensued. Now most of the Mi'kmaq guys got put into the lockup, and the white boys were told to go home. And I've been you know, watching the Kenesataki resistance uh, unfold in Oka the year before on television, and I've been deeply horrified by what I saw there as the overt racism. Uh, but I was kind of removed from it through, through the lens of television as, as a spectator and, and, and as a white person rather than as an actor. But then I met Junior, and as Junior started to weave together for me the nightmares of his wrongful conviction, any faith I had in Canada as a just society was evaporating. That night in Halifax on the street, I realized that the rage-infused racism, the rawness of discrimination, was far more widespread and volatile than I'd ever imagined. It was ugly, it was frightening, it was violent, and I didn't understand it. And I was soon to be immersed in it as I became Junior's fishing wife. It's through the generous storytelling and deep patience of my many Mi'kmaq teachers that the edifices and treacheries of colonialism were revealed. And I have been determined to fight against, to unsettle my ignorance ever since. I've committed my scholarship to nation rebuilding, to treaty rights and self-determination advocacy. I tried to use my privilege in the academy to keep in the foreground the transformative legacies of Mi'kmaq since time immemorial so that indigenous temporal priority will not be undone by denial, neglect, lies, broken promises, or silencing, or by some self-congratulatory ticking off of a box, or worse still, forgetting, as Duma mentioned. If we as settlers are to have some hope at building right relations with indigenous peoples and nations, the edifices of ignorance, of apathy, of feigned benevolence, of heroic pioneering, of entitlement and ownership and righteous, uh, settler righteousness and intolerance must come down. Reconciliation cannot just be about goodwill inclusion in settler institutions either. It must include settlers in coming to the understanding that substantive, sustainable, generative, paradigmatic shifts in the relationships, nation to nation, knowledge systems to knowledge systems, persons to persons must be required. Unscrewing 500 years of intricate assimilative scaffolding and sandblasting the concrete of 150 years of willful blindness will take some work. And I'm really glad to see so many of you in the room today with the tools in your hands to take the edifices down, to make restitutions, to return the space for reinvigoration, and to learn how treaties are honored. Indigenous peoples have been talking about writing the relationships for a very long time. In their commitment to reconciliation, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation provided the resources and encouragement to Indigenous communities across the country to address the far-reaching legacies of abuse, cultural genocide, assimilation, racism, and discriminatory legislation by building on their people's strengths and to sustain self-determination. It was a genius model of governance and engagement. The Aboriginal Healing Foundation understood the importance of relationships. They recognized that any efforts to dismantle the colonial apparatus and the justificatory ideologies that feed it had to mobilize hope in the hearts of Indigenous peoples. Their success was grounded in, the faith in their faith in community-driven, community-based organizations, in community knowledge, in community reality, in survivors' experiences, in Indigenous cultures and identities thousands of years old. Not some remote policy, not some complex bureaucracy, not some crisis management, not some homogenous band-aid remedy. The Aboriginal Healing Foundation respected diversity and they understood better than anyone, I think, the responsibility of their healing work and what legacies they needed to shape for future generations. The Healing Foundation was in very good hands. It was in the hands of the people. And Dr. Degagne, through the Healing Foundation, 
forged more than 120 partnerships to help thousands of people uniquely embark on the most important healing journey of their lives. The AHF built their relationships, enhancing self-worth in individuals, communities, nations, families, to sustain well-being, to tap into that resilience and recognize the, their dignity after generations of denigration in our institutions, education, health, justice, social, religious, economic, and government. It nurtured the very, re the re very roots of the reconciliation dialogues we're having today. And thanks to their exemplary work, those roots took hold. Without the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, I'm not sure where we would be uh, right now, and I don't think we'd likely be in this place of hope and action. The transformative uh, legacy of the Healing Foundation is like the proverbial iceberg. We only have seen the tip of the cultural rejuvenation, recovery, and restoration of spirit. The impacts are immeasurable. It has led to governance models to protect diversity and foster identity and a resurgence of Indigenous institution building and that is what reconciliation is about. The termination, or as it says graphically on the wiki page, the extinction of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation remains an outrage. Yet, another terrible policy decision in the ever-shifting matrix of accountability avoidance brought to you by blank insert name here of whichever federal office responsible for Indigenous peoples is in charge today. But we move on. And I think for one, we have a responsibility to learn about these transformative legacies, to, as part of our reconciliation journey, make every effort to understand the legacies on which we stand today. The Aboriginal Healing Foundation is a momentous one. Learn from that literature. Their documents and activities are the blueprints and roadmaps for substantive, strategic nation rebuilding and reconciliation. They point the way forward to honor and respect. In my concluding remarks, I turn to the treaty imperative and point to what I see as a major obstacle in taking down the colonial edifice. In a recent province-wide review of the Marshall Inquiry, Mi'kmaq people shared deeply intimate accounts of their experiences with the Canadian justice system. With alarming regularity, people spoke about painful incidents where they felt they were mistreated and misunderstood by police, lawyers, judges, and service providers. Consistently, people identified both the Marshall Inquiry recommendations from 1989 and the Supreme Court decision in Marshall, 1999, as foundational to establishing Mi'kmaq justice system and imperative to self-determination. But they recognized serious structural obstacles impeding the implementation of the recommendations and in the exercise of treaty rights. These were identified as a profound lack of awareness or knowledge regarding Indigenous treaty rights, the failure of, uh, to identify and respect the Mi'kmaq as a nation, and the denial by settlers of the legitimacy of Mi'kmaq governance and legal principles in the management of their lands and resources. We have Section 35 of the Constitution. We have not just the Marshall decisions, but we have a whole host of decisions by the courts affirming treaties uh, and telling us to honor and respect them. We have commission after commission, recommendation, calls to action. We have hundreds of years of Mi'kmaq knowledge, rituals, and traditions of treaty diplomacy and treaty principles being translated from generation to generation, yet do we have good treaty relationship? Can you identify in your practice or in your pedagogy a substantive, productive relationship to treaty or Aboriginal rights? One of the greatest obstacles to reconciliation amongst, is amongst agents of the Crown, such as the DFO and their lawyers. In their pervasive characterization of the Supreme Court decisions affirming Indigenous treaty rights as losses. That requires a paradigmatic shift if we're going to ever get to reconciliation. Crown Indigenous relationships remain adversarial and the response to the perceived losses, Crown agents aggressively assert their regulatory power and control over resources and territories that do not really belong to them at the expense of Indigenous peoples' rights and self-determining laws. The DFO stance, in large measure, while reflecting the attitudes of many non-Indigenous constituents, is counterproductive to reconciliation and puzzling in light of the federal government's declaration that that most important relationship is one with Indigenous peoples. Indeed, Trudeau says it's time for a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship based on recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. 
Yet still, in just at the end of last year, a federal fisheries official says, we, the DFO, have been tested in court many, many times on issues related to fisheries by indigenous peoples. And I'll put it to you bluntly, in most cases, we come out on the losing side of those issues. And we need to be careful moving forward that we don't create another situation that results in another precedent. And that's a possibility. We didn't think we were going to lose the Marshall case, but we did. And the hostilities persist, and the hostilities are out there today because treaty rights get constructed as something settlers have to give up. And this treacherous ideology is reinforced by the attitudes of those running the regulatory institutions and their enforcers. Reconciliation for many requires the full recognition of Mi'kmaq rights and title, meaningful consultation and fulfillment of the fiduciary obligations of the Crown. Without rights education and the implementation of Mi'kmaq treaties, systemic discrimination and poverty are going to contribute to intergenerational impacts. They're going to generate conflicts with the law. They're going to limit opportunities for justice to be lived and felt by Indigenous peoples. The authority of Indigenous legal principles and practices need to be recognized. They think Dumas got an excellent idea about an institution and supported. And these systems need to be decolonized through self-determined incorporation and the use of indigenous ways of being, whether it's through ceremony or knowledge translation, some kind of collaboration, respect, and education. Remember the law of honor, get me de dimenege. One honors the relationships with each other and the ancestors and the lands and the waters and their gifts, but does not own them. One has a responsibility to them, not ownership, over them. So in speaking with you about education and reconciliation, I ask you to consider the transformative legacies and the relationships you have to them. I ask you to think about what does your treaty relationship look like? And please consider how will you act and honor to respect those relationships and to learn the laws of the land of the people, the laws of the peoples of this land. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to come to your territory. I meet my brothers and sisters and cousins. And this Friendship Center, when I first came here, was a year after the Simon decision was made in the Supreme Court of Canada. I, my memory may be jogged, but I think it was 1986. And this is where I met Matthew Simon. And when you're involved in a case in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, my good friend uh, Bruce Wildsmith at the time said, will you come and partner with me because the treaty involves also those from New Brunswick. I said, I will. And I was curious, well, who's this guy, Matthew Simon? You know? But it's here where I met him. And I uh, was introduced to him and I asked him, could I ask you what really happened on that day? And of course he did. And we were talking about storytelling. Mm -hmm. Where do you begin? Where do you end? What do you share that hopefully will be significant? to the Indigenous students who are here. My first exposure to an Indigenous issue was in the winter of 1968, when St. Francis Xavier University had a teaching on Indians. And so I was in my last year university, and I said, why not? I got a free afternoon. I'll go there. That was the first time I heard two indigenous elders speak about indigenous rights. In my community at Tubic, Negritkova, Willisko, Willisko, as we call ourselves now, 
No one in my community ever mentioned two-year-olds. No one in my community ever mentioned about the traditional ways of our people. No one in my community talked about what the law was before the arrival of other races. So needless to say, my background is in math, science. I, this was a total new experience for me. That's not the event that motivated me to become a lawyer by all means. When I graduated in 1968, I went back to my home community up in Tubic, and I wanted to be a teacher. Because the students from my community went to the public school. So I went to summer school to get a temporary teacher's license in New Brunswick. Now school opens in New Brunswick at that time in the middle of August because of the potato harvest. So between the course and the starting of the exams on a Friday and a Monday morning, Saturday morning, I went to see the principal and the superintendent of that area because I was going to be signing a $3,600 contract. <laughs> now $3,600 in terms of comparison, the cost of a Mustang was 1800 bucks. <laughs> so I said, this is a good deal, I'm going to have wheels. Mm -hmm. But to be generous, there were philosophical differences. They didn't want an Indian to go teach at the public school. And my mom had asked me to go to university, St. of X or elsewhere, get an education, come back and help our people. And the first job you try for when you face discrimination, that's why I call it philosophical differences. It really hits you hard. However, the benefit of that is how I ended up at law school at UNB, because I was looking for something else to do. And so I got accepted into UNB in the fall of 68. I knew absolutely nothing about it. And I didn't, I didn't have an interest in politics. Thank goodness I behaved myself so I wouldn't go to youth court, or whatever they call it back then, juvenile court. And I kind of kept a low profile. So I was immersed in the fall of 68, the UNB Law School, immediately with something very new. And the only methodology I had was my mathematical background. Because in math, you're taught this, 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 and this, and then the answer is there. <laughs> Law, you're dealing with precedence here, precedence there, precedence there, so this must be it. So that fascinated me. And, uh, but, as luck would have it, you know, sometimes, uh, Tumar talked about somebody approaching somebody, encouraging you. After I finished my first year of law at UNB, I had an opportunity to go work in Toronto to do legal research. I was the only indigenous law student in 1969 who was on his research program and the book that eventually came out was Native Rights in Canada. And this was my first exposure on Indigenous law to decision making in the United States, Canada, and in Australia in with Indigenous rights. It was also assigned to me then to deal with 500 years of history, starting with the contact of the Spanish, the role of the church, the role of the United States Supreme Courts, and then ultimately Canada as well. Dealing with indigenous rights from an international perspective. Because they weren't examined at the time in terms of human rights instruments or human rights law. So how do I compact 500 years of legal history, theology, political, and all these other aspects 
into 10 minutes. I can't do it. So why did I choose this? Well, when I was contacted by the dean, and I looked at the TRC, I said, what is it that I still have a firm passion about? What is it that I would like to engage the students I teach and the other people I get involved in about what it is that I learned, I can share, and hopefully motivate and encourage them to go the next step. I chose the calls to action 45I, 46-2, 47-49. And why? Because they deal with the doctrine of discovery and terra nullis. So in the research I was assigned in the summer of 69, and right after, of course, Columbus came, and right after, in 1493, the Pope of the day, Alexander VI, issued a papal bull authorizing Spain and Portugal to go around, civilize those heathens, civilize those savages, make them into followers of Christ, so they'll be one of us, and we'll have the right to exploit their land. So, when I saw that, and I'm Catholic, I was brought up Catholic, and I saw in the history the savagery of the Spanish soldiers. They raped the women. They stole the land. They made the people into slaves. And if they didn't, they were shot. You know, people talk about genocide. People talk about Holocaust. Holocaust didn't just happen to the Jewish people. Genocide wasn't just experienced by the Jewish people. It was our brothers and sisters who lived south of us. When you read the diaries and the conquests that the conquistadors did, you'd have nightmares. So in this shocking environment, there were certain voices that were voices what I call in the wilderness, in the indigenous wilderness. One of them was Bartholomew de Las Casas. Now Las Casas came from a merchant family and was sent to the New World to make money for his dad and for the company. However, he saw how the indigenous people were treated. He saw how they were abused. <coughs> He saw the destruction that took place in their spiritual temples. And he couldn't stomach it. He changed his life to be a Dominican priest. So he contacted another strong voice in Spain, a man by the name of Francesco de Vittoria. And who is Francesco de Vittoria? Francesco de Vittoria was a doctorate in theology teaching at the University of Salamanca in Spain. And King Ferdinand started to hear these dissatisfactions in the New World, so he asked Victoria, can you write me some advice as to how I should treat with these indigenous peoples? Victoria took the challenge, produced two books, which in fact challenged the authority not only of the Pope of the day, but the authority of the Spanish and every European power to be able to assert discovery, to be able to assert terra nullis, to be able to assert that slavery was all right. Now, as happens, the king of the day did not like the opinion of Francesco de Vittoria. What does he know? But Vittoria didn't stop, you see. But Turia, and at the time, we're not talking about planes, trains, or automobiles, he had to ride a mule to Rome. Now, the opinion to the king was 1534. Not long after the introduction of the European contact with indigenous peoples. The Pope of the day, Paul III, he convinced him to issue a papal bull in 1537 which contradicted exactly what the Spanish king and other European 
sovereignties were saying they could legitimately do. And this document of 1537 is still a valid document in the Vatican. If you look at the speeches that Pope John Paul II has, when he was still a pontiff, when he came to Canada in 1984, and in 1987, each time he said, I am here to uphold what my predecessor said in 1537, Paul III. So that is still a very valid document with one of the first authors who legitimately tried to say it was okay. So now one of those partners of that colonization have completely withdrawn from those concepts. And actually that papal bull was in fact over, I guess, erased or whatever you want to call it, shortly after it was proclaimed in 1493. So where do I jump from there to where in five more years there's going to be this major celebration about the United States Supreme Court who made the decision of Johnson and McIntosh. So what's Johnson and McIntosh all about? And does it have any relevance in our country? Well, Johnson, Johnson and McIntosh, and then later one, Booster in the state of Georgia, both of those cases is where the theory of discovery was decided by the United States Supreme Court. And they went back because they said European powers had to have among themselves some kind of an enmity of understanding. So that if France came to this part of the world, the British came to this part of the world, the Dutch came to this part of the world, and all the other Europeans, well, the first one here gets the monopoly. Literally, that's what it is. They would have the franchise of dealing with the tribes in that area, the nations, but it diminished the power that our ancestors had because we could not relate to anybody else about our sovereignty. So to me, 2023 uh, is not going to be your celebration. Now whether I'll still be around or not, a good guy asked me, well, geez, how old are you anyway? <laughs> when all these things are done, I said, well, I'm 72 years old. Uh, but I age well. Uh, but, I'm not sure if we're going to be around in 2023. But for those of you who are thinking of law, for those of you that will still be law students, for those of you that will be judges, also remember what happened in 1823 and how it has influenced the common law of this country as well, which to me does not make it right. We knew, of course, the Chief Justice of Canada in the case of British Columbia said that Terra Nullis was never a part of Canada because of the Royal Proclamation of 1763. So what do the Canadian judges now in the courts, what do our law schools teach our students? Okay, there's an Aboriginal title. But if you assert the Aboriginal title, there's these certain tests that are set up and more so if there's an economic interest on indigenous land, traditional as well as current territories we have now. That seems to be a litmus test. But doesn't that contradict what was there before discovery? Where our people were nations, where we had our own territory, we developed our own institutions. So why did Marshall think Europeans could get away with this? Well, I would say, read that decision. Because he thought we were ignorant. He thought that we couldn't cooperate. He thought that we were raw like, holy gentlemen, we're going to give them a civilization. We're going to rescue them. Well, how did the Acadians survive in Mi'kmaq country without the help of the Mi'kmaq? They would have starved to death. They didn't know where to get the water. They didn't know where to get the food. They didn't know how to get clothing. The same thing with my community. And I'm sure the same thing with every tribe in the Americas. So what's our compensation? What's our consolation prize? We allow 
the current system of law to dictate to us what we can do. And to me, that is the biggest human rights violation, not only for us as Indigenous people, but around the world as well. So if you try to implement the right to self-determination that's been recognized by the United Nations, you can see now why the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand balked. It was only when they were assured in 2010 that, look, you can still continue to develop resources in Indian country. You can still go put your pipelines, put your mines and everything else through indigenous country. It was only then that Canada said, yeah, we, I think we can support something like that as long as we're allowed to benefit from the indigenous resources. So that's the big challenge. You as future deciders will be. I hate to say I fought the good fight. I feel like St. Paul. <laughs> I hope I'm not writing my own eulogy. <laughs> or what's going to be put on his tombstone. But you need to do it. You need to do it for the future generations. Believe me, from 1971 to now, I wish I knew what I knew now back in 1971. And I'll just finish with a couple more. I got a whole bunch of this stuff. I don't even want to read it, but <laughs> it'll be in the papers, I guess. The How many are studying to be a law student this year? Don't be shy. How many want to be a law student? <laughs> How many indigenous lawyers? Okay. In 1975 to 1980, there were maybe just 10 of us across this country. 10. I was a lonely boy from the East Coast. Wilton Little Child was one of them from Alberta. Leroy Little Bear was another. And there were two others. And the National Indian Brotherhood, which was our political organization at the time, had convinced the government, the Trudeau government, to have discussions among the cabinet representatives as well as NIB representatives. I was assigned the portfolio of justice. Who was the minister? Mark Lalonde, a right-hand man to Trudeau in Quebec and in Montreal. A very learned man. Trudeau himself was a lawyer. But let's not forget, Trudeau is the one who said, Aboriginal rights are historical might have been when he was trying to advance the white paper policy of 1969. So in this workshop, I go in with the Minister of Justice, and there were others, and we're sitting down with Mr. Mark Lalong, and he's a very impatient man. <coughs> okay, Mr. Nicholas, what do you got to say about these topics, about relationships between the governments and your people? What would he do? I didn't know I had people. <laughs> but I say, well, I'm going to tell you something. Through case law in the United States, tribes have been recognized as nations. There might only be a certain part of domestic nation of a kind, or domestic sovereignty of a kind, but the United States Supreme Court has recognized, and in their rationale in the early court decision, they said, who signs a treaty? Only nations can sign a treaty. So the tribes, according to the dictionary of Oxford Dictionary, they had to say the tribes are nations. The tribes are also sovereign because how can you as a nation sign something unless it's recognized? He says, that's a non-starter. We don't want to balkanize Canada if we have 500 tribes, 500 nations in Canada but that wasn't his reasoning. 
he was afraid of what was happening in Quebec, the separatist movement. So he couldn't legitimize with us then our grievances of in fact what the law had recognized in the United States that in fact there were nations and that we had sovereignty. And the United States made it quite clear that the word nationhood, the word treaty, the word sovereignty are English expressions. Just how can we now say that they're not nations if we sign treaties with them? You see? So that's the struggle still going on in the international arena that you're going to be exposed. Mi'kmaq our nation, Willistagwig our nation, Pasquapati our nation, Penobscot's our nation, Nishinaabe our nation, Decree our nation, all our tribes, our nations. That's what we were always. And that's what we should always be. Now, just to give you another very sad part, I hope some of you who are going to be judges later on as an indigenous lawyer. In my career as a provincial court judge in New Brunswick, from 1991 to 2009, which was 18 and a half years, the Department of Justice of the province of New Brunswick would never allow me to have a case dealing with treaty rights or Aboriginal rights in New Brunswick. The prosecutor would jump up and say, well, wait a minute, oh, probably they knew how radical I was, <laughs> because they had, they had lost so many cases that we advocated. He said, well, we want you to recuse yourself. No, you have to have the backing of your chief justice in order to stand strong in a court. So another judge would be conveniently brought in my particular court, take over the case. And I'm talking about right to 2009. At what stage do you trust the judiciary to be neutral? At what stage do you trust the legal system that they so highly think is good to allow a different voice, a different interpretation, and a different set of eyes? You see? So I commend what Tuma is doing. It should be the Americas institution with satellites all over the place. That's what we need. Because we need all kinds of indigenous jurists. We need all kinds of indigenous lawyers and professors and all this to come together. Is it possible? Well, why was it put into the calls of action that I enumerated a little while ago? So that we repudiate the theory of discovery, we repudiate paramounts. That is the challenge that I see. I'm not sure how much longer I'll be around, but my message is going to be the same. And why? Because we owe it to the seven generations. That's why. We do. We should not be made ashamed of our past. Was Europe free from wars? Back in the 14, 15, 1600s? Was Europe void of religious conflicts back at that time? It was free over here. So who brought in the violence? Who brought in this stuff? Was it us? Or was it them? Because of what our people had. I know it's a tough message, but please look at the stuff that I'll eventually leave to the dean here for what I wrote. But we have to have a different set of lens. It's not true, it's in British concept that the crown has the ultimate title, but who had the ultimate title in our nation? It was a collective right, not an individual right. Because we benefited our human yet. Now, does the property of law that we talk about, talk about collective rights? Does it talk about sharing the resources among the people who are the top 5% on 90% of the resources? Is it the law that legitimizes that process, you see? 
as I said. It's a good thing I didn't know what I know now back in 1971. I might have been incarcerated. <laughs> and not necessarily in a prison, but in some other institution. Because we've got a revolution who's gone. Now, just to conclude. As I said, inter cetera, the document of 1493 has been abolished here after it was proclaimed. The United Nations has been told by the Vatican that that was never a valid call anyway. And yet that's the one that the Europeans decided to act on for their benefit. So to me, we should, as a community, we have to do it with our brothers and sisters of all backgrounds, all knowledges, all races in Canada. If we want to bring justice, if we want to bring reconciliation, as our good friend Marie says, it's not going to be an easy journey. There is going to be some painful steps. But he said, it's education that got its mess, so let's use education now to get us out of this mess. Thank you very much. Next we have Associate Chief Justice Lawrence O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I first want to express appreciation for the opportunity to be here to participate uh, in this very important event. Uh, Acknowledge uh, my Chief Justice uh, McDonald and uh, of course the Dean and representatives of the University and the other leaders. Um, as has been indicated, uh, um, I am a judge. I have been a judge for 10 years and for seven years I've had administrative responsibility for the Family Division of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia. And in that role, uh, our judges, or my, my, uh, my role has been to administer uh, with judges uh, in Halifax and in Cape Breton, uh, other parts of Nova Scotia, there's a family uh, court. Uh, our division of the Supreme Court uh, deals with all, child, all the child protection files in Halifax Regional Municipality and in Cape Breton represents about 55 or 60 percent of the uh, child protection files uh, in the province. And uh, if you re review the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action, you will see that the first five are focused on a child protection. And in my view, it's no accident that those are the first five uh, calls to action. Um, and so, uh, in my capacity uh, as the administrator of the court, leader of, of the family division, I was approached several years ago by two senior members of our court, uh, Justice Claire McClellan and, and Justice Moira Legere Sears. And they said, you know, Lawrence, we're doing these child protection files. They pertain to the First Nations communities. We really don't think we're making any difference. We don't think we're doing uh, much of a job here, contributing to the problem. Uh, and I said, I agree. Uh, it, was, it was a statement of the obvious. So the, the, the discussion was, what can we do? We should do something. And uh, I said, I agree. And uh, so there was a coincidence of attitudes. Uh, to effect change, uh, and the discussion led to, okay, we don't know what we're doing uh, in terms of what we do next, so let's visit the university. So we ended up at the uh, Cape Breton University uh, at Duma Young. We went to the library there at the Unamaki College. We met Professor Augustine, and we said, like, we don't want to demonstrate our lack of being informed or our ignorance for the sake of a better word but we would like to have some outreach we'd like to visit the 
talk to the communities, the First Nations communities, about what they think we can do better or a different way of doing business. And so we started that dialogue, first recognizing our limitations. So uh, in my short note there that you'll see on the tables, on retrospect, I guess we were humble about uh, our position. And so we did start. And <coughs> so <coughs> there were these meetings we had, and I kept getting pushed about Lawrence, you know, what's the, I said, we're going to have a meeting. What's the, and then of course that led to the question, what's the agenda going to be? And so I kept having to put that question off because the agenda was going to be what it had to be when we got into the room together. And so I had some contact or knew some of the persons in leadership in the First Nations community. I was comfortable with First Nations people. I'd been in the homes of First Nations people in my capacity as a member of parliament and also as a lawyer with Nova Scotia Legal Aid. I would visit the homes, meet with people. When I was with Legal Aid, I would go to the homes, often pick up a youth, and we'd drive to court to, together. And I knew from those experiences how different the worlds were, to some extent. Obviously, I knew very little, but I knew that knew that. I knew that as a defense lawyer, by the time we got to trial, it was all kind of academic and kind of a, a bit of a, a Walt Disney experience for some of them because the issues had been resolved in the community six months later. So people didn't want to show up to be witnesses and all that kind of stuff. So in any case, um, I then decided, well, how are we going to do this? Well, people don't, I can't just pick up the phone and call people, so say my name is and we want a meeting and all this kind of stuff. I knew I had to meet people and introduce myself. Uh, so I visited the offices of the chiefs and I didn't, uh, I dressed in a casual manner and I sat down in their offices. And some of them knew, uh, uh, knew sort of of me and uh, so then we chat. We just chat. It wasn't about an agenda. It was just, this is who I am. I'm concerned about this. They're, they're concerned about it. So it was about building relationships. And that's sort of my main message is you want people to work with you, you have to introduce yourself. And you have to show them respect. They will show you respect. And I went to their offices. I didn't write, I didn't phone and say, come and meet me at my office, come and meet me at a hotel, or whatever. So that kind of relationship building went on for six or eight months. And I got their input about a meeting and um, what we should do. And again, I was very careful to not communicate that we were there or the judges were interested in suggesting what should happen. It was to learn. And it, that wasn't just to get along. It was because I thought it, was, it had to be the case. Um, and the image that I've used in other presentations, and I'll repeat it now, is as a judge, I'm at the front of the room in Sydney, for example. And I look down, and there's a, there's a First Nations person, perhaps one or two parents who are First Nations. Obviously, I'm not. The minister's lawyer, child protection lawyer, would not be typically. The lawyer for the parents would not be. The sheriff would not be. The clerk would not be. As I said to a group of uh, judges uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I'm to look down at this mother or this father and uh, say, um, and uh, invite her to trust me and trust the system. And uh, although not spoken, I would, I would not, it would not have surprised me or would have been fair for her to say or him to say, you took our land, you took our country, you took our children, and now you're taking my, children, my child. So, and you're asking me to trust you with your system? So recognizing that dynamic is, in my view, 
critical. It, it certainly, from my perspective, and the perspective of those judges, um, something that had to be recognized. So, uh, with the support and leadership of Chief Justice McDonald, um, all the Chief Justices of the Superior Court came with the entire family division to member two to have a meeting. And you have to understand my role, I would have to be concerned about the judges thinking, what's he up to, you know? What's, what, you know he's got this idea. So um, it was the first meeting outside Halifax of our group of judges. And my rationale, quite simply, was this. Many of judges, many members of the public, have stereotypical views of First Nations communities. So you can spend a lot of time in seminars and classrooms or whatever. Or you can just go visit people in their community. And you go, you take people to member two, and you see the convention center, you see the Hampton Inn, you see the Tim Hortons and the pharmacy and the corner stores and the streets and the two or three pad ice rink which opened six months ago or so. And that's a picture's worth a thousand words. So in terms of educating members of uh, the bench of which uh, I'm part, uh, that was my thinking. The other part of it was to, to just challenge those stereotypes. The other part of it was um, to allow the judiciary to meet First Nations people lawyers, social workers, business people, political leaders that are in the community that we might otherwise not have contact with. In other words, you must trust, you must trust the First Nations leadership and the community. There's a lot of strength there. And so that was the rationale. Uh, and we went there and we met and we were at eight or ten tables of there were about 50 or 60 people, and there, were, there was a judge or two at a table, and, and First Nations people, and there were discussions and reports, and Duma Young spoke. And so, from our perspective, it accomplished a lot in terms of trust building. Uh, and of course, it's all about, it's not all about the talk, it's not just a photo op, it's not just the current. Uh, preoccupation of society. It has to be lasting. And we recognize that. I recognize that. And so we have continued to work. And as I indicated in the notes I left or that are at the table, in um, this spring we will be sitting as a as a court in Wagmacook, the uh, First Nation, the uh, first uh, superior court in Canada. We deal with child protection. So <coughs> there has to be results, and the First Nations people uh, speaking, well, I'll speak to it. The answer to the problem in First Nation, with First Nations and child protection is in the community. I deal, obviously, with a lot of non-First Nations child protection files. In my <coughs> opinion, the answer for the for child protection files involving families that are not, not First Nations will come from the First Nations. The approach that they've educated me about, they wish to have dealing with child protection will be far, in my view, will be far more successful than what we are doing in either the First Nations or uh, the non-First Nations community now in terms of child protection. Um, so I'm excited about that given the work I do uh, as, a, as a judge but also as a citizen. And I'm going to close by relaying a little, ex an exchange I had with Chief uh, uh, Leroy Denny Escazoni. Escazoni is a community of several thousand people, it's about 4,300. And part of my travel around, I went to see Chief Denny. Um, and uh, we had lunch, and then he showed me around the community a bit. And, uh, he, uh, he talked to me about child protection and talked about the other issues uh, that affect the community. And through all of our discussions, 
he became emotional at one point, and that's when he was talking about child protection, and he talked, he said, you know, child protection is the modern day residential school. And he talked about the fact that we're lucky in Cape Breton, most of our children who go into foster care can be placed with the First Nations family. It's not so on the mainland. So uh, I thought, wow, I hadn't heard it expressed that way. Uh, so it is a huge uh, challenge, but I believe, and I think we're there, we're fortunate, I think, in, at this point in our history as a country, where resources will be uh, devoted. I think the level of education throughout, not only in institutions, but my institution, the judiciary, <coughs> we are reaching out, we're recognizing what we have to learn, and um, I, I, I expect uh, that what First Nations want will be achieved, that is their own, I'll use the word for the, of my tradition, court system. Um, will be achieved, uh, it will be far more successful uh, than what we've done uh, with our model of uh, child protection. And uh, so, um, I'm optimistic, I believe uh, there will be success. And uh, I think, as I, free, as I was told the people I met with early on, Trust me, we're not trying to keep the word. We're happy to give you the jurisdiction, I am speaking personally, obviously, to give you the opportunity to solve, to address your problem. And the people that I've met in the First Nations community and I know are more than capable of, uh, of uh, solving it with, uh, and as Duma knows, we've talked about the customs of the First Nations people which are far better suited than the legislative uh, constraints that, that we have. So, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Justice O'Neill. And we now have Professor Naomi Metalla. Um, I think we'll, we'll finish with the presentations before we take a break. We'll shorten the break and then come back afterwards. <laughs> I was going to get them to do jumping jacks or uh, something like that. Well, thank you. My, my uh, remarks won't be all that long. I hope not. I don't think so. Uh, first, I want to thank all the cool panelists. It's amazing to hear you. And uh, um, yeah, so many wonderful insights. Uh, thank you to Mike uh, for being, uh, for all you have done, first of all, and also being the wonderful impetus to have this discussion here today. I also want to take, thank the Friendship Center um, I mean, for all the great work that they do, but also for being our hosts, and I think, as you said earlier today, uh, Dean, uh, opportunity to do more things here. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the, the work that we're doing at the law school, because it's already been mentioned uh, several times, and I didn't want to get up here and uh, sound like I'm reading a laundry list and be self-congratulatory. Although, I do have to say that I am ever so grateful, as she's left now, but to um, Anne McClellan for, 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 the position, for creating the position of Chancellor's Chair, which is allowing me in my role at the law school to do things that I don't think I would otherwise <coughs> be able to do. And also, I'm very thankful for uh, faculty, staff at, at, at the law school who are on the um, TRC committee with me. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I think that we're trying to do good work and there's always room for improvement, <laughs> but I think that um, I'm very happy with you know, what we're trying to accomplish and uh, what we hope to accomplish in the future. So I didn't want to talk, like I said, uh, too much about that because it's already been mentioned. So here's what I really want to talk about for my brief period of time uh, today. Um, I think one of the things we've heard is that there's so much work to be undertaken uh, in reconciliation. Um, you know, we heard Duma talk about the need to revitalize of our languages and our laws. Uh, we heard uh, Justice Nicholas talk about, you know, reforming Section 35 and, you know, getting rid of uh, terra nullius and, and doctrine of discovery. And it all needs to happen. Uh, such important work. And there's one area that I also want to highlight where we need to be doing more work in order to get to the point where 
we're um, implementing our own justice systems and our laws, we also have to have healthy, functional communities, right? Who, uh, who can do this good work, right? Um, and for that to happen, you know, it's been mentioned several times, but we need, it needs to stop that our First Nations children being taken into foster care and placed in non-Indigenous homes in, you know, record numbers. And also, uh, you know, the mass overrepresentation of our people in uh, the criminal justice system, both as offenders and as victims, needs to stop. Um, and in 2018, our people should no longer be living at unacceptable rates of poverty, which they continue to live in, facing numerous barriers to employment with high unemployment rates. Uh, probably the unemployment rates, I think, Mike, you mentioned them earlier, maybe in the 70s they were at 90%. I don't think they've changed very much. Um, and we have people who are on you know, welfare uh, in communities some of the, uh, with rates that haven't changed for 26 years. Right? We've done quite a bit of research here in Atlantic Canada on that, and the stories are really mind-boggling that this situation is allowed to persist. Communities face inse uh, food insecurity, um, uh, the housing stock is inadequate, and also there's a huge housing shortage. And we, we communities I visited last summer, some places you have seven to ten people living in a house together, and some communities, because they're put under something called uh, third-party management, haven't been allowed to build a new house in five, 15 years. You know, so these are what I refer to, I believe, all to be human rights abuses that are happening daily, right under our noses here in Canada. Um, and but we're not often talking about it, and that really <laughs> bothers me. And I'm not saying that any of the things that we need to be doing, uh, implementing our laws, just rediscovering and revitalizing our language and our laws, and all and, and implementing under it, it all has to happen. But this is so important to getting our, our people. You know, uh, uh, we can only be you know um, in this situation to be implementing self determination if we have healthy communities. And right now. Um, the socioeconomic position of our people is really preventing a lot of that from happening. You know, uh, some, some manage to get into universities and go to law school, but you know, imagine if we actually had functional communities. How many more wonderful indigenous people would be out there making a difference? You know? um, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this is over the weekend, I read the fourth compliance order from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in the Caring Society case, and I don't know how many of you know the Caring Society case, but it came out in, on January 26, 2016. So it's already reached a past its two-year anniversary. Um, and this is not the first compliance order from the tribunal, it's the fourth. So four times a party since the, the sort of watershed decision from the tribunal that found that Canada has been knowingly underfunding child welfare services on reserves for over a decade, um, they've had, the parties have had to go back now four times and, and, and the tribunal is pretty clear this is going to be the final time on immediate remedies that the, the parties should be coming back and in fact this time the tribunal made some pretty strong orders about what Canada is to be doing. Um, but it's really funny too because Canada did not appeal the decision and talked about that it was going to be complying with the ruling and said that, you know, you know, it's said a lot in the last two years about implementing TRC and implementing UNDRIP and it passed the 10 principles about the relationship. Um, and, um, you know, the compute and the tribunal, I mean, despite the fact that Canada has been saying the right things in the public eye, the tribunal found that in many ways in, in the ensuing two years since the original decision, Canada has failed to comply with the decision in significant ways. And what struck me when I was reading the decision this weekend um, was that, you know, despite all these good things that were being said in, in, in public, um, all the while Canada has been before the tribunal after losing um, and still uh, behind the scenes making the same types of arguments that it lost uh, at the tribunal in 2016. In fact, the, the tribunal mentioned this in this fourth compliance order that Canada is, was trying to rehash some of the same arguments that it lost and which it didn't appeal. So uh, I'm glad the tribunal didn't accept uh, uh, those arguments. Um, but it left me thinking of three things. So here they are. But the first thing is, why don't more Canadians know about this decision? And why aren't more people up in arms about it? You know, uh, and, um, ACJ O'Neill just said this. Um, 
Um, but, you know, it was, and it was also noted in the tribunal decision itself that the child welfare system, the First Nation child welfare system in Canada is replicating the residential school system. And didn't we say never again? It's still happening, right? So these are, to me, situations that are <coughs> intolerable and completely unacceptable. So it's really hard for me to fathom why it's still going on right under our noses. Okay, so that was point number one. My second point is that, you know, I have this fear and I get invited to a lot of places to talk, um, but, I, you know, and going back to how Canada has been saying the right things in public, but behind the scenes arguing something different, how do we effectively dress, uh, address what I might call false or at least window dressing reconciliation efforts? You know, several of our panelists have already said that the work's going to be hard. You know, and um, there's um, a quote I recently heard from uh, Pam Palmer. Uh, Dr. Pam Palmer about reconciliation, and it keeps haunting me, and I'm saying it more and more, but <laughs> she says, and it might be slightly an overstatement, but she says, if it feels good, it's not reconciliation. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, some, there, there's, a, there's a grain of truth in there, right? So there's lots of activities going on, and I think there's lots of important stuff, um, but I think we need to be critical, and uh, to some extent, in our lens of you know what what is happening under the mantle of reconciliation, um, I think it's fair questions to ask. I mean, I think blanket exercises are important, but doing one blank, blanket exercise for your you know uh, in, institution and then no more is not sufficient. You know, and also questioning is having a speaker series, one speaker series, or having a panel. I mean, these are important things to do, and they raise awareness, and, and there is relationship building there as well, but it cannot be sufficient. And I, so, um, you know, I, I question, you know, how do we ensure that we are, you know, doing activities and things that are meaningful, meaningfully achieving reconciliation? I don't know if somebody needs to come up with standards or guidelines on what that is, but or maybe someone has been thinking about it. But, you know, I think that, you know, surely to goodness, you know, the work that needs to be done has to include making um, significant structural changes. And many of our panelists have already talked about that, right? And it's going to involve redistribution of power, lands perhaps, and other resources, right? And we need to be having adult conversations about those particular issues. Um, so my third point is what is the role of education in all of this? Um, I think we need to be teaching more about these ongoing human rights abuses. I think many Canadians sort of, you know, live with this idea that Canada is a wonderful country that uh, has a, a stellar human rights record. I mean, I'm proud of many things that Canada has done, the, the legal institutions, but we have to recognize that there's been significant human rights abuses that have happened and that are still happening, right? Um, and they need to be talked about. Um, and also just so many stereotypes that need to be addressed uh, through the formal education system about Indigenous people, you know, that we get everything for free and uh, that, uh, you know, somehow even despite, you know, that we have this poverty, so it must mean by virtue of that that we are somehow incapable of managing our affairs or that our leadership is incompetent. Like those are still deeply ingrained in the Canadian psyche and we need to be addressing them. Um, yeah, so what else can uh, education do? I think in building, you know, in teaching people about this, this is where we'll get our advocates uh, and allies. Um, and more pressure needs to be put on institutions of power to be addressing this. This is really the only way that, you know, these issues are going to be uh, addressed, particularly the underfunding of essential services for Indigenous people. I mean, Canada has known for a long time that it's doing it, unless the Canadian populace is shaking their fist and screaming, how can you let this continue? It's going to continue, as it has for decades. Um, yeah, and I, I think a major point is uh, that I made earlier is changing structures. Uh, that really there has to be big structural changes, both internally and I think um, externally. And I'm talking about their um, uh, formal education um, in universities. But, you know, hiring of faculty and staff and greater admissions of students. Michelle spoke so passionately earlier about you know, the great work of the IBNM initiative. I am so proud to be uh, a, a graduate of the initiative. And uh, I mean, it is amazing the work that programs like the initiative, uh, the, the results that it's having. You know, the fact that uh, two, over 200 graduates soon, um, you know, there's a startling statistic to kind of get your head around how important these initiatives are. And I'm gonna pick on New Brunswick 
uh, a little bit. There are over 50 uh, Aboriginal lawyers practicing in Nova Scotia. There are over 50 African Nova Scotian lawyers practicing at the bar. Do you know how many uh, Aboriginal lawyers are practicing in New Brunswick? I can count them on this hand, right, versus 50 here. IBNM makes a huge difference, and our graduates are making massive differences across the country. So access programs and, and putting work into, you know, realizing that the system's, you know, just, you know, hoping that the system will eventually fix itself is not going to happen. We need to, you know, make fundamental changes to, uh, to structures in order to make a just society. And I think uh, we can uh, be doing more and doing things differently than our institutions perhaps have previously done. Um, uh, Mike spoke about this, but actually going to communities, um, speaking with the communities, uh, and actually figuring out what their both educational and service needs are, and maybe coming up with creative uh, programs that would actually be in the communities. So there's so many things that we could be doing. And, um, but I feel in a major way I'm preaching to the choir, but um, I do think that there are, uh, and there's been great work that, that people in this room have been doing, but um, still lots of work to be done. Thank you.